changed. And I think there's ample field for reform and amendment. Dinner at York Factory, 1821. The bitter taste of amalgamation still lingers over the fur trade. Simpson calls former Norwesters and Baymen together. Two of the guests once fought a duel, as trader John Todd remembers. They had hacked and slashed at each other with swords only a few months before. One of them still bore the marks of a cut on his face, the other, it was said, on some less conspicuous part of his body. I shall never forget the look of utter scorn and utter defiance with which they regarded each other the moment their eyes met. The message from the dinner is unmistakable. The two sides may never come to love each other, but they must work together. Simpson also makes it clear who is in charge. Then the streamlining begins. I intended devoting this ensuing winter to a tour of Columbia, where the broom and the pruning knife, I believe, are much required. With hand-picked paddlers and clerks, the little emperor races through the river systems, reshaping and reorganizing the Hudson's Bay Company's domain. In six years, he gets rid of half the employees and closes 73 posts. He is as caustic as he is callous. The Columbia Department, from the day of its origin to the present hour, has been neglected, shamefully mismanaged, and a scene of the most wasteful extravagance and the most unfortunate dissension. His enemies call him a tyrant, and he has words for them in a secret diary he calls his character book. Colin Robertson, a frothy, trifling, conceited man who would starve in any other country and is perfectly useless here. John Clark, a boasting, ignorant, low fellow who rarely speaks the truth and is strongly suspect of dishonesty. His commanding appearance and pompous manner, however, give him a good deal of influence over Indians and servants. John Rowand. Although his education has been defective, a very clear-headed, clever fellow will not tell a lie, which is very uncommon in this country, but has sufficient address to evade the truth when it suits his purpose. The cuts go to the very heart of the 200-year relationship between the company and the natives. He does reduce by half the amount of alcohol traded, but scales down the traditional trading ceremonies. It will be a work of time to reconcile the Indians to the new order of things. I have made it my study to examine the nature and character of them, and however repugnant it may be to our feelings. I am convinced they must be ruled with a rod of iron to bring and keep them in a proper state of subordination. Over the years, like many fur traders, Simpson takes several country wives. He lives with Betsy Sinclair for a year, and when he tires of her, he writes to a friend. If you could dispose of the lady, it would be satisfactory, as she is an unnecessary and expensive appendage. I see no fun in keeping a woman without enjoying her charms, which my present rambling life does not permit me to do. Margaret Taylor is pregnant with their third child when Simpson decides a country marriage no longer serves his career. Again, he leaves instructions, this time about the baby. Pray, keep an eye on the commodity. And if she bring forth anything in the proper time and uh, of the right color, let them be taken care of. But if anything be amiss, let the whole be bundled about their business. He goes home to London in search of a suitable wife who can raise his social profile. He settles on his cousin, the refined Francis Simpson, who at 18 is less than half his age. She is frail and stays only two years in the West. 
They move to Montreal and he continues amassing a fortune. In 1841, he is knighted. Sir George Simpson brought modern business practices to the backwoods. The little emperor has transformed the business of adventure. David Thompson spent almost three decades in the Canadian Northwest, often accompanied by his family. He married Charlotte Small, the daughter of a Cree woman and a Northwest Company trader. Together, they have 13 children. In 1812, the Thompson family heads east for a retirement full of hope and promise. David Thompson has not walked on a city street since he left London as a 14-year-old boy. He buys a house in eastern Ontario and sets to work on his master projects. A map and atlas of the Canadian Northwest. It takes him two years to finish his map, more than 50,000 miles of travel on paper. Nothing less than an unremitting perseverance bordering on enthusiasm could have enabled me to have brought these maps to their present state. In early life, I conceived the idea of this work and Providence has enabled me to complete, amidst various dangers, all that one man could hope to perform. But publishers reject his atlas. The fur traders don't want to share the information on his maps, and Thompson's years of perseverance go uncelebrated. He begins feeling disillusioned, bitter, and even betrayed as politicians carve up the land he charted. He always felt the Columbia River should have been British because he had surveyed it first. But boundary decisions continually favor the Americans. It may be said that the country thus acquired by the United States is of no importance to England. Be it so, then let England make a free gift to the states of what the latter require. History will place all these transactions in their proper light. He takes jobs as a land surveyor, even plotting Alexander Mackenzie's estate in Montreal. He is slowly growing poor. On the river named by David Thompson for the explorer Simon Fraser, a native trapper was taking a drink of water. When he reached in and found gold. On an April Sunday in 1858, citizens of Fort Victoria, a Hudson's Bay Company fur trade post on Vancouver Island, step out of the church to an astonishing sight. In the harbor, 450 prospectors have arrived from San Francisco.
Victoria's population doubles in one day. In the next four months, 20,000 people pass through Fort Victoria on their way to the gold creeks of the mainland. James Douglas, the very proper Hudson's Bay Company chief factor, quickly assesses their character. This body of adventurers are represented as being, with some exceptions, a specimen of the worst of the population of San Francisco. The very dregs, in fact, of society. As American gold seekers pour into Hudson's Bay Company territory, James Douglas realizes as a fur trader he has no real authority over them. But he fears that the land the prospectors stake could become American. If the country be thrown open to indiscriminate immigration, the interests of the empire may suffer from the introduction of a foreign population whose sympathies may be decidedly anti-British. And if the majority be Americans, strongly attached to their own country and peculiar institutions. James Douglas takes bold action. Without authority, the fur trader acts as governor. He declares there will be no prospecting without a license. And he issues the license on behalf of Queen Victoria. All persons who shall take from my lands within the said district any gold, metal, or ore containing gold, without being duly authorized in that behalf by Her Majesty's government shall be prosecuted, both criminally and civilly, as the law allows. On August the 2nd, 1858, Queen Victoria declares the Hudson's Bay Territory a British colony. She calls it British Columbia and names James Douglas its first governor. Four years later, Samuel J. Hathaway, a 30-year-old printer from San Francisco, heads up the trail, hungry for gold. On the 17th, I and two other young men concluded to try our luck as partners. So we bought a mule together and a load of provisions, enough to last six weeks at least, and on the 18th took another step for the caribou. The caribou was the site of the biggest strike. A prospector named William Barker and his partners sank a shaft deep into the ground and hit pay dirt. Hundreds of thousands of dollars were lifted from one claim. A boomtown sprang up, Barkerville. And for a while, it was the biggest settlement west of Chicago and north of San Francisco. With 20 saloons, Barkerville was the Wild West in James Douglas's British Columbia. But Samuel Hathaway will never strike it rich like Billy Barker. Along the Caribou Road, his panning for gold becomes more and more desperate. We meet many men returning already. Most of them have not been through to the caribou. For myself, I expect nothing and try to think as little as possible about it. I am in for it now and must see it out if it takes my last dollar and leaves me dead broke in a foreign land. 
His partners leave, but Hathaway won't turn back. He continues searching for gold. Finally, with winter threatening, he does find some, but he has stayed too long. He cannot get out. Samuel Hathaway is trapped in a tent on the trail, with an infection slowly crippling him. Could not get out to work today. Tried it. Took me nearly an hour to get on my boot and hobble off 50 yards. Then I just crawled back again. It is very late in the season, and if a big snow comes within a few days, how shall I, a cripple, get out? In the spring, another prospector finds Samuel Hathaway's journal and his frozen body. The gold frenzy lasts eight years. By 1866, it has faded away. But the influx of dreamers like Samuel Hathaway has transformed Hudson's Bay Company land into a colony and five years later, a province in what will become a new nation. By the mid-1800s, the sun is setting on the fur traders west. In the vast land of Peguis and Salkamapi, of native trappers and European fur traders, there is talk of railways and a new country that will control the northern half of the continent. Before the whites entered our country and became residents, we had always plenty. The river teemed with all kinds of fish, and the plains were covered with buffaloes, and the woods full of deer. But now, all is gone. The glory days of the fur trade dwindle. Aristocrats in Europe are now wearing top hats made of silk. The beaver hat, the fashion that opened the West, is going out of style. David Thompson spends his declining years trying to sell his journals, memoirs of his expeditions, of crossing mountain passes, of racing down the Columbia, of charting a continent. But people aren't interested in a retired fur trader's adventures. The 77 volumes sit unpublished in his lifetime. Now, in his 70s, he is poverty-stricken. He sells his winter coat for food, and finally his most precious possessions, his surveying tools. But the man who looks at stars could still spin tales. His daughter Charlotte remembers him, sitting in his rocking chair for hours, reminiscing. He seemed to live his life over in talking to himself aloud anecdotes of travels with his companions. We could hear him laugh heartily over them, with tears streaming down his cheeks. David Thompson dies in 1857, 10 years before Confederation.
Section by section, the land he charted will be plowed into farms and blossom into thriving cities. Calgary, Edmonton, and at the confluence of the Red and Assiniboine Rivers, Winnipeg. The days of pathfinders and trailblazers have passed. It is a new era with new challenges and new dreams. A modern Western Canada. <laughs>